Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Week 5, Part 1, Image Classification. This week we're going to be talking about advanced classification techniques. We're going to start off with a refresher on image classification, then talk about image segmentation and object-based image analysis before covering machine learning in two lessons, and finally ending with accuracy analysis. As we have seen, remotely sensed images can be difficult to interpret. They're usually taken from angles that we don't normally see, and they often have scales that we aren't familiar with. Our goal with remote sensing is to derive information from the raw image data. We want to classify or identify the objects in an image. We might be interested in identifying the burn scars from wildfires, mapping water bodies, or mapping different vegetation types. As you might guess, identifying each and every pixel by hand is an extremely time-consuming task. It can also be physically exhausting, so we normally want to avoid this as much as possible. The process of categorizing raw image data into information that can be used by non-specialists or that can be used as input for further study is what we refer to as classification. The output of a classification routine is a thematic map of the image. You can see here an example of an image on the left and a thematic map identifying each of the different land covers present in the image on the right. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about automated classification routines, that is, how we can make the computer do the work for us. There are a number of different ways that we can characterize different algorithms. We've already seen a few of these in EGM 713. We can do manual classification, where we manually identify the pixels in an image, or we can do a supervised classification, where we identify some of the features in an image, and the computer uses that information to determine which of the identified classes each pixel belongs to. In an unsupervised classification, on the other hand, the computer automatically decides how to separate groups of pixels with no input from the user. Classifications can be spatial, where we use spatial information to identify the objects in an image, or we can use the spectral characteristics of the image to identify objects. We can also first group pixels into objects and then determine how to classify them, and we'll talk more about that in the next lesson. Parametric classification methods use an assumption about the statistical distribution of the input data in order to parameterize the input data and somehow interpolate the pixel values in order to do the classification. Non-parametric algorithms use some other way of classifying the image based on the input data. Physical models involve modeling physical processes, for example, modeling the interaction of electromagnetic radiation and a surface in order to help identify that surface in an image. Empirical models, on the other hand, use the properties of the image data in order to assign real-world properties or categories. We might also think about the fact that many pixels actually cover multiple different surface types. In that case, we assume that the spectral value of each pixel is some combination of defined pure materials, also called n-members, that provide us proportion of the pixel value. This is also what is known as a mixed pixel. We can then use this to determine the fractional area of the pixel that is covered by a given class type. Alternatively, we can assign the class based on the characteristics of the pixel and ignore the potential problem caused by these mixed pixels. Finally, hard classifications make a definitive definition about what class each pixel or object belongs to, while soft or fuzzy classifications allow for some level of uncertainty and overlap by estimating the degree of similarity that a given pixel or object has to each class. Note that these are not mutually exclusive categories. The classification that we did, that you did in EGM 713 was a supervised maximum likelihood classification meaning it was both a supervised classification, but it was also parametric, as the algorithm uses a parametrization of the training data to assign the class values to each pixel in the image. In this lesson, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the most common distinctions, including supervised and unsupervised classification. In the next lesson, we'll talk about spectral and object-oriented classification. 
and we'll also talk about parametric and non-parametric classif classifications in this lesson. As you have seen, unsupervised classification means that we have little to no user input in the classification. Instead, the algorithm determines how best to group the pixels based on their statistical properties. Common examples of different types of unsupervised classification include k-means clustering, isodata clustering, which produced the image shown here. The output classes themselves have no meaning. They're just grouped based on the statistics of the image data. The user then has to identify what each of the spectral classes represents. You have to actually give the classes meaning in order for them to be useful. Once you've run an unsupervised classification, you can also combine different classes. In the example shown here, you can see there are at least three different unsupervised classes that are identified over water, depending in part on the colors that we can see in the true color image. In supervised classification, we train the algorithm using pre-identified areas. These training areas should have uniform characteristics. The larger the spread of pixel values that we include in a training class, the harder it is to have a clean separation between the different classes. We also want them to be spatially distributed throughout the scene as best as possible to help counteract any potential differences in illumination across the image. The computer then uses the data contained within the training samples to determine which class each pixel belongs to, depending on the algorithm used. Some different examples of algorithms include maximum likelihood, as you have used in EGM 713, minimum distance, which calculates the geometric center of each of the different classes based on the input training data. For each pixel, the distance to each of the different classes, or the centers of each of the different classes, is calculated, and the pixel is assigned to the close, cl closest class. In a similar vein, k nearest neighbors takes the k closest training pixels to each pixel and assigns the pixel to the majority class. Finally, parallel epiped essentially draws a box around the training classes and assigns all of the pixels that fall within each of the different boxes to that particular class. For most of the software packages that do supervise classification, such as ArcMap or Erdos Imagine, you can normally look in the help menu for more information about the different algorithms available. We'll show how one of these different examples, maximum likelihood classification, works. In this example, we have three different cl training classes shown here, with the rest of the pixels in the image displayed as red X's. Using the training data, the algorithm calculates a probability distribution function, or PDF, for each of the classes. The PDF is a measure of how likely a given pixel value or combination of pixel values is to fall within the given class. So a pixel located here would be more likely to fall within the dark green class. It's pretty close to the peak of the probability distribution. A pixel here would be more likely to fall within the light green class for the same reason. Note that this approach usually assumes that your training data are normally distributed that is, they follow a normal or Gaussian distribution. This is, of course, not always the case, but it's another thing to keep in mind as you are selecting training samples. Using this example, we can determine which class a pixel located at the location of this red square should belong to. You can see that it looks like it could belong to either the dark green or the light green class. You can see that the color level of the probability distribution is the same for each of these classes. And if we extend a line from the red square, the probability of a pixel at that location being part of the dark green class is just slightly higher, but it's pretty close. This might be an example of where we need more training data to calculate a better probability distribution, or it might be better to employ a different classification scheme here, such as a fuzzy classification. In this lesson, we have discussed how our goal in remote sensing is often to extract meaningful information from raw image data. We usually want to avoid classifying images by hand. It's extremely time consuming and it can be difficult to reproduce. And if we're trying to do this for many images as many common applications in remote sensing are now using, 
uh, this is going to take even longer time. We discussed how automated classification schemes can be categorized in a, num in a number of different ways that are not mutually exclusive. That is, a given algorithm that we use can actually fit into several of the different categories that we discussed. The choice of algorithm that we use is going to depend on the input data that we have and the particular application that we have in mind. Once again, you can read more about the concepts covered in this lesson in the different textbooks, uh, Chapter 7 of Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, or Chapter 9 of Jensen. I've also included a link to a video that discusses k-means and image segmentation, which we'll talk more about in the next lesson, as well as an article on image classification in ArcMap. I've also uploaded a copy of an article that provides an overview of different classification algorithms. It's pretty long, but you can read it to find, more, find out more about a number of these different types of classification. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.